Hello, my folks. Welcome to the Website Intelligence Podcast. Here is Dragos, Head of uh, Enterprise at Visa Analytics and Matt, Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, and today we have Nemanja with us, which uh, uh, he's the founder of Funky Marketing, which is doing uh, a different kind of uh, B2B marketing in a funky way. He, would like to, he likes to refer to it. He also has a, a nice background in the non-governmental sector, which brings a totally fascinating combination. Welcome, Nemanja. Hey, guys. Uh, good, to, good to meet you and uh, happy to join you and have a nice uh, combo conversation and discussion. Uh, thanks for, for being here. So, guys, as you know, we're diving straight into the topics, which is the first segment of our podcast. Questions uh, at the beginning or on the background of our guests. Emania, so where did you grow up and what would you say was unique about being there during your younger years? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I grew up in, in Pirot, small town in uh, southeast Serbia, so near the Balkan mountains. And... Um, What's interesting is that, uh, you know, it's a small city, now, now basically a, a small European city, which, which grew the most in the last 10 years compared to the rest of the country because we didn't have the same government, <laughs> which is interesting because we gather all the funds from the cross-border cooperation uh, and made the city greater, but we didn't change the mindset. It takes a lot to change the mindset. That's why I'm not living over there anymore. Uh, but um, it's... Pretty interesting because I, I grew up in the 90s when we had like a civil war, we were bombed, those kind of things. We couldn't travel abroad. We had sanctions. So luckily I was playing basketball. My father was a coach and uh, I had a chance to travel at least around the country and some of it in Bulgaria. Uh, I used to live a couple of times in Bulgaria also, uh, sometimes on my own, sometimes with my father because he was a coach over there, basketball coach. And uh, basically, like growing up in all that environment uh, kind of got me to, you know, to speak freely about things because I was the captain of the basketball team. My father was a coach, so everybody else had an excuse not to talk to the media. I didn't have any. So I, I needed to adjust those things and learn how to talk, how to express my things to the, uh, you know, to the teammates, to myself. Uh, I studied marketing, even though I didn't want to study marketing. I wanted to study tourism, something else, but, uh, you know, I didn't get on the state budget and I needed to change the city in niche. And that's why I ended up in marketing. I thought of marketing as advertising, as commercials, you know, as uh, all of us uh, do. I was playing basketball, so like they were all over the news, like the um, commercials with Grand Hill, uh, Sprite at the time, you know, those kind of things, Coca-Cola versus Pe Pepsi uh, and all those other stuff. And uh, I mean, I even convinced all my friends that they go to study marketing as well. And it was mm -hmm. the, the most difficult uh, department on the on the university and the one with the most exams so they cursed me after that uh, but anyway <laughs> I did I didn't learn much uh, I learned a lot about some um, some topics which are unimportant for what marketing is today I learned about how much corn they grow in US uh, in Texas like those kind of things uh, I mean I learned some of the things which are related more to organizational structure uh, but about marketing, I didn't learn much. So uh, first I made a break uh, and went to the, to the NGO sector, basically to organize, started with organizing parties and something that young folks have something to do in, uh, in their free time uh, with two friends that were DJs. So that kind of uh, went, went along very well. I went to Bulgaria also to spend like three months to learn how to do marketing as well in hotels, but they were only like, female accountants smoking 10 of them in one room and, and gossiping. So I, 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 I left after two hours and I didn't come back ever. <laughs> so uh, basically, you know, I, I grew the page of the, of the NGO uh, for at the time that was, it was a lot like 5,000, 5,000 people. Uh, everybody from the city went to the page to find out the news, uh, not only related to the youth, but also related to other things because they raised, uh, raised some important issues, uh, you know, and I need to advocate for the youth rights and a lot of other stuff. I started organizing huge summer camps on the Balkan mountains, basically with 200 people from 18 countries, 
to uh, help uh, stop high mountain villages from dying, uh, help them relive the tourism, actually, you know, make it alive for the first time ever. Uh, and got some people, you know, from Jamaica, from Venezuela for the first time over there. I did it all without the budget, only using Facebook groups. Uh, and I learned that, that the story is the most important thing. I learned how to manage people because when you have 200 people, nobody likes to give you feedback directly with all of them. So you will need to find some way to, to do it. Uh, and basically, uh, I was, you know, we got the award for the best uh, youth organization working with people from vulnerable groups. Uh, I worked with UNICEF for two years uh, and basically got the award, the, the biggest award in Serbia for, uh, for like youth policies uh, for two years in a row. Um, and um, kind of that got me engaged in speaking all around Serbia, around the Balkans. And one day when it was uh, a little bit hard times, uh, I'm finishing soon. So uh, my father find out that, uh, found out that he actually has a cancer and he is dying in like three months. It was like, are you kidding me? So, so that's kind of how, how it happened. At the same time, my mother couldn't walk. So she was at the hospital in Belgrade. I was with my father in, in, in Pirot. Um, and my sister was pregnant. So it was all about me. So I quit uh, writing the project. It was around May or April when you submit all the projects. So I was living out of that. Uh, so basically, uh, I had to quit all of that to take care of, uh, of my father, of my mother, those kind of things. My mother luckily got, um, got better. She's all healthy now. I mean... Now she has some different issues, like the heart operation and everything, but it's not related to that. And basically, uh, when I started thinking what I'm going to do with my life, because I needed to, you know, to start from scratch, I got a call two years after somebody heard me on a conference speaking, saying, hey, we heard you at that city at that time, like our CEO, who's now in Canada, uh, was over there in the crowd with some other people that are working for the agency, Canadian based marketing agency. And they say, what do you know about marketing? We would like you to, to come and work for us. So I knew, I knew a lot. I didn't know SEO. That is the only thing that I learned back in those times. SEO was like adding meaningful comments to the, to the <clears throat> articles, reading them and then finding out what can you, uh, give value through the comments. Basically that was, you know, link building at the time uh and um i found out in like 13 months everything that i know that i didn't know that i know so in 13 months i've become the first gm of the agency we were like 15 people three departments development design and marketing um and basically uh i had only the two guys above me uh which were the owners i had all the rights and all the responsibility as they had uh, the last one coming to the, to the company, the first one, uh, to become the GM. So I had a lot of, uh, jealous people over there. I had a lot of people that, uh, weren't have, a, they didn't have a place in the agency looking at what they know and how they perform those kind of things. And I knew nothing about the processes. I didn't have any password and the owners just left for a month. Uh, and told everybody Nemanja is in charge for everything. You can go to him for everything. So I needed first to Google to learn what is the process, how I can structure those things, how I can do one-on-ones, you know, a lot of different st stuff. It stopped the company from growing. It slowed us down, but it uh, advanced my career at least two years uh, ahead. So, so that's kind of the, the beginnings, let's call it like that. It's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a combination of a lot of things there. And it's a lot of things that we've kind of heard in the past, you know, it's a, like this, this whole kind of like learning marketing thing. You know, a lot of people, when it comes to studying marketing, they, they say the same things is you can't really learn that much. And actually you gain the most experience when you're kind of thrown in at the deep end <laughs> and you have to quickly figure things out in terms of structure, process, different strategies, this kind of thing. Um, amidst all of that kind of stuff, you know, uh, in, you know, including the kind of difficult moment with your father and, you know, your mother being ill and things, what would you say were like kind of two or three, like really key moments in terms of the, the marketing perspective, which really kind of gave you clarity in terms of what you felt were the important parts of marketing and what you felt you could contribute to the most? Yeah, like, uh, like two things. First, uh, first one is, uh, 
value first, the money will follow. Uh, and I learned that, uh, you know, basically because um, looking at that time period and also ahead, I never applied for a job. Like the job, somebody was always watching and seeing what I'm doing and finding value in that and reaching out to me. That's how I also got uh, got the agency, the first the first big client from this area, because they come to me and they said, you know, like um, a girl that was doing SEO for us uh, just is going to work in a search metrics in Berlin, so we need somebody else to jump in. So we rec she recommended you. Uh, we know that you don't work for, with companies from Serbia, but uh, you know maybe for us you will make. Uh, you met an exception that's that was the biggest media gruppation in Europe at the time uh, and uh, funny thing is I didn't know the girl that recommended me she was only following me on Instagram and LinkedIn and looking at the results that I'm sharing processes and all those other stuff uh, and the second thing is uh, relationship are the essential thing uh, that uh, you know you need to focus on I learned that because the the owner of the agency uh, at the time when he came to Serbia, he rented a car and uh, drove to, to Pirot, to my city, to spend the day with me. Just to get to know me, to see what are my goals, what are, uh, you know, the things that I want to achieve. So I told him I want to have my own creative agency. And in like four months, he called me and said, uh, you know, um, I listened at the time. And now uh, I would like to give you a chance to, to have your own agency. So basically take ours. You know, uh, and uh, I can add the third one, which is I learned about dark social at the time, which is now like popular frame. And I don't like to go into the nerdy stuff, but um, they were um, basically renovating uh, the huge space that we have uh, in the city, like open space with basketball field, uh, handball field, those kind of stuff. And everybody got a chance to organize an event that summer, except for us. And we were the most active organization working with youth. My father was working in the home of culture. I knew the mayor. I knew the my father's director, right? So, uh, and because I'm loud and I'm direct and I'm honest and I like to advocate things that are hard, so they didn't allow us to do it. So I uh, crafted a Facebook post saying that that's not okay. Mention everybody who are involved, not offending anybody, just giving the, the clear state of the things like everybody got a permit to do something we didn't um and in like three minutes my father called me um to you know to ask me what am i writing on facebook uh because his director called him to ask him the same thing and before that like the mayor called uh his director to ask him the same thing and the mayor doesn't have social media so it all happened in three minutes uh and after that call, my mother called me because my father had time to call her and to ask her, do you know what, what this, our son is doing again, <laughs> you know? So, so I found out how the dark social is working. Everybody's seeing things and it works outside of your control and it can happen very fast. It's like your dad screenshotting the message from the mayor, showing it to your mom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, at, at the time we didn't have like, uh, you know, most of them didn't know how to do the screenshot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, only only the director of Com of Culture had uh, had social media. Like my father didn't have it, my mother didn't have it, but that's how it went. Anyways, uh, it's uh, coming back to your your what you mentioned about the personal touch of the actual actual relationships between between human. We actually uh, see this now with the COVID and the remote working. When, when, whenever we have the chance to meet clients, we just went we just went to Web Summit in Lisbon as well, and meeting clients there, meeting them in person, knowing people, and receiving uh, back uh, feedback from them is so essential. But <clears throat> coming back now to the current role you're you're uh, you're at at uh, your agency at, at the Funky Marketing and B two B, which is a B two B marketing agency. Let let us know some more details about your current role. Yeah, basically, basically um, in 2020, I uh, left the agency when I was director of operations, actually the second the second guy in the company, uh, because uh, I saw things a little bit differently. This is where I went to specialize in uh, email automa automation, email marketing, website automation. Basically, we were doing some pretty advanced stuff for 2018. 
uh, early 19 um, for for this region. Basically, you can, you could have uh, changed the testimonials, the images, the the headline, everything based on uh, if you click the ad or if you click the email on where you are coming from, what have you done before, um, and. Uh, Basically, we brought the automation to, to Serbia. Like, uh, but focusing on performance marketing, I learned that it works very well. Usually, they say automation works even when you sleep, right? But it works uh, only until you paying for it, right? Uh, so when you stop paying, the performance marketing stops working. So uh, I was always, you know, looking at my background, I was always somebody that was focusing on on brand, on content, on relationships. So I went that uh, in that direction. I didn't know that I'm going to go in B2B because I was working only in B2C uh, before that. But I had like 9,000 connections on LinkedIn. So I was trying to get uh, at least a conversation with all of them. So like 260, 70, 50 minutes uh, virtual coffees that I had at the time. Uh, and basically, I saw the gap. That, is, that keep repeating. So at the time, B2B was looked as a, as a mystic, uh, you know, foggy. Nobody was uh, focusing on emotions, on humans. Uh, like literally, when you say the account, they meant the factory, the building. In B2B, they didn't look at it as, uh, you know, uh, as the account with buying committee inside it with specific position that you need to have a different conversation with. Uh, in order to uh, to facilitate the buying process, um, and also uh, I saw that uh, you know from what I know uh, and the experience that I have for B two C, I can implement it in B two B. I started doing it right away uh, and focusing on LinkedIn, just sharing all the things that I'm seeing, things that I'm talking with uh, with clients, um, and. I was lucky that from the beginning, one of the first clients, actually the first night that we got the landing page and the 30 uh, pages PDF as a strategy uh, for people to download. The first one was uh, Impa Hub from Belgrade. And basically for the for the next like six months, we were in charge uh, to getting startups into their pre-acceleration program. So I got to, uh, I was also a mentor there. So uh, I got to uh, to work with a lot of startups, actually confirm all the thesis uh, that I had about, uh, you know, how they work, what are the problems, uh, what are the, the gaps that I can fill in uh, and just went on all in. And basically the, uh, you know, through the content, through creating demand, I got people who are uh, still now working with me and I got, the the clients and we were able to uh to close uh if i'm not wrong uh, around uh 47 48 clients in the first 18 months uh some of them really big players uh dragos you maybe know them from from this area like h tech group uh and you know some of the 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 biggest player from this area in tech development but also yeah. some of the SaaS companies from europe going into the u.s market uh and it kind of uh you know set up the direction it will be going one thing that i need to mention is that was the time when you know kind of other people also found out that like uh, i think a year ahead of me was chris walker and refine labs so, uh, you know, that's where the shift started to happen, lead gen to demand gen. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's funny because people are comparing us. That's why I'm mentioning that. Uh, I don't think we are comparable because I like to keep my thing small. Chris has like more than 100 people, 120, I think, in the team. Um, and uh, what is interesting is like from time to time, they refer clients to us, which are not fit for them meaning they may don't have the same software, those kind of things. And it tells me one thing that I'm always uh, advocating for, not one company can change the market, can change the narrative and the things. We all need to work together to achieve the bigger goal. And that's where we are gonna create the bigger demand and all of us will have will have a job, right? It's, it sounds really interesting. It's, um, it's something that we're kind of going through a little bit now at Visitor Analytics because like, we've grown very fast this year in terms of the marketing team. And in terms of the strategy for this year and next year, it's trying to balance all these things, you know, like um, focusing on, um, you know, data and numbers and revenue growth, 
but also at the same time trying to figure out how we uh, build a brand, how we you know become known in a different way and change the perception of our brand, this kind of thing. Um, we're rebranding completely beginning of next year. So that's another big challenge. Nice. Um, out of interest, like how, as, a, as an agency, because it's hard enough when you're in-house and we have great support from the, the CEO here as well. Um, how do you balance this like approach whereby you're kind of convincing companies, you know, don't just focus on, you know, numbers from each campaign you have, focus on the long term, focus on, um, you know, personal brands, focus on brand marketing, focus on, um, you know, this self-attribution and dark social like aspect as well. How, how do you kind of convince uh, new clients uh, about this kind of balance between this kind of approach? Yeah, the thing is, I, I don't. I okay. don't convince them. I only try to work with those that are convinced that they're coming to us. Now it has become a problem because obviously the demand creation started to be a term on Google. Uh, that's how I, I look at that because the content started to work. We, we don't uh, focus on SEO, but we try to optimize each piece of content. So we started to get traffic from Google. And those are people that, you know, are coming to us and are not in a rush to buy. You know, so th those are the, the people that uh, look at us as nice to have. You know, they already have uh, probably an agency doing solid work and they want to, to see if they can work with us to get to the next level. So, uh, but as the crisis is over there, if, uh, you know, if uh, we are uh, in the same uh, level as they are when it comes to pricing or maybe more expensive uh, or we are coming from Serbia, right? For the US company, that's important. Um, they just say, let's postpone it, right? Because in a crisis, you go for must have, not for, uh, for nice yeah. to have. So you go for the, for the category, not for the brand. I like yeah. to look at it like that. Um, and those that are coming to us via demand that we are creating, basically they are coming from spe specific stuff that we are talking on the podcast, that we are talking on LinkedIn, for example, like, um, uh, I also have this thing, how did you hear about us, right, on the website, uh, and why would you like to work with us? And we see that people are saying, you know, like, uh, I like your uh, go-to-market thesis. Uh, it seems like something that is very different from what I'm seeing in uh, industrial space where we're at, and we like to try it out. Uh, some other people say, you know, uh, you're the powerhouse when it comes to B2B, and I'm like, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, so that's interesting to find out how people are uh, are perceiving us, how they are looking at us. Uh, but when I start working with companies, uh, I was a fractional CMO in two of two of uh, two of those uh, SaaS companies. Uh, and the thing is that I found out is they always like to try things uh, on their own example. So I can come in and I always say, look, we can go with lead gen model. And you can get like 3,000 leads that will result in like 60 calls uh, out of which maybe you'll close uh, or even like less calls. You will close like six clients. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's like the average uh, that I'm seeing. Do, would you like to avoid spending that money? Take that data and try something new. Or would you like for us to test this on your own example? And... Uh, you know, see the results and then go into the next one. Guess what? Everybody likes to spend money to see it or their own example, you know, and it's, and it's not like a little bit of money because they look at the lead like $50 uh, and they look only like cost per lead, right? Yeah. So usually there's a marketing person working on that. There's somebody doing the advertising part. There's a budget for advertising uh, and there's a salesperson involved. So uh, it's from 2000 to $10,000. It's not like $50, right? If you uh, unlock all the costs, um, eh, but they need to see it or their or their own example. So I always start with uh, figuring out how we are closing the demand, seeing how much demand it is over there, and then seeing if we need to create the demand or we just need to go and... Uh, and damn the demand, basically take the existing demand and create the subcategory, take it in our own direction. For most companies uh, outside of tech, they don't need to create demand. Most companies have enough demand. If we, Even if we say 1% is ready to buy now on Google, for majority of companies, that's enough. And, uh, you know, there's a narrative on LinkedIn that everybody needs to create demand. You know, in crisis, you should, but... 
first take a look if that one percent is enough because like tech companies are usually bringing something new uh meaning you know coming up with ai tool coming up with something else because you cannot do the survey right you cannot do the survey and ask people because they will give you the answers from what they know they will give you the answers, but it's what they know if they don't know that your product exists they cannot give you the answers but if you don't deliver on the answers that they give you they will be pissed at you right so you cannot go into that way you need to create a totally new narrative before they have the buying intent uh, and create a relationship with them so they uh, when they come up with, with a problem when they come up with something they will go uh, directly to you and uh, you know uh, look for solution um, and also uh, the peers are becoming more and more important because if you if you uh, check out I'm sure it's the same situation with you as as with me. Like you're spending more time interacting with our peers on social than we're actually doing our job. You know, because that's how we get educated. That's how we get information. You know, yeah. all those kind of things. Like a couple of years ago, we didn't have communities. Yeah. Now we have like at least we are all member of at least three communities. Uh, you know, uh, related to what we are doing. We have like, yeah. at least ten people over there that we know that we would like to ask some questions. Hundred percent. Right? So yeah. we have we have people that we can pick up the phone and call. So we have direct uh, a line with somebody who is I don't know like in the US that we can ask them. We didn't have that before, and it changed the way uh, we are buying B two B products. I was yeah. I was buying recently the scheduling tool. I just go for LinkedIn. I ask in the community, and a couple of people reach out to me. They are considered my peers. They were on my podcast, so uh, they gave me the information. We didn't even go to the the, to Google. I just yeah. go directly to the website because like eight out of 10 gave me the same answer. So I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to go for it. I would go to Google if I didn't have the straight answer or I would go, would like to to compare pricing or maybe check out the, the cases, check out what the employees said, those kind of things. But that's like additional information that I maybe need to make a decision. Exactly. That, that's exactly why we're here today in Riverside. <laughs> Um, because it was from uh, Exit 5, you know, David Gerhardt's uh, community. Uh, and I completely agree. Yeah, it's, it's this huge, like, community shift. Um, we even have this kind of, like, philosophy towards it here, which is, like, learn and share, basically, which is, hey, any opportunity we have to learn, let's go for the opportunity, let's connect to people, and then let's share it with our community as well. Um, because we have that unique position where everything we learn is also valuable to our audience as well. So it, it kind of puts us in that uniquely, like, kind of beneficial position. Um, Sorry to, uh, yeah, one, on, go ahead. yeah, one thing that you mentioned is, uh, you know, the website, the data and those kind of things. And you mentioned Dave. So I'm going to go back, uh, you know, uh, working in performance marketing agency. Basically, that was the time when Drift, when Dave was a Drift and they uh, launched the category. Right. Ba ba basically, it wasn't a category. Right. They, they just renamed the things. Chatbots yeah. are now like conversational marketing. Uh, yep. But they did it awesomely with creating a small uh, networking group uh, in Boston, which is full of the tech companies, see that there's attraction, then publish a book, those kind of things. Uh, but we bought a book and uh, two weeks, I think it was two weeks or three weeks after we bought a book, after we, uh, it arrived, the postman came and brought another book from Drift, did they send for free to us as additional value because we bought a conversational marketing and it was named um, things that don't scale, right? They wrote a small book when they listed 40, I think, things uh, that they have done to, be, to build a hyper growth company. And it became the book that I gave to every new member of the team to find out how things are working, you know? Uh, and that's where I found out, you know, how do you actually deliver additional value? And, and you know, uh, and I got attracted to Drift and I look how are they, you know, started, how are they uh, going up market, how are they changing things? Uh, I look at the website and one thing that stood out for me is like they were always building kind of the, the hub, the content hub on the website where you can go and, and you can, you know, basically get educated about all things related to the revenue, 
right? And they make a shift. They were uh, basically going for conversational marketing, but um, I think it was last year or two years ago. I don't know. I remember I had a COVID and I was going back from the um, uh, from the hospital uh, and uh, I was listening to David Cancel, the CEO, talking about how it's time for them to make a shift because we know we can now measure marketing on different stuff except for the for the MQLs. Right, so they make, made a shift to revenue. Marketing can be measured or revenue. Uh, and this is the first one that I can mention that I learned, you know, a lot of stuff. The, the second one is beard brand, which is kind of interesting because uh, I have in my hometown the, the beard man club, basically a uh, bunch of people uh, from different environments uh, raising money, raising awareness about uh, the men's health, helping uh, children and other people that need help. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was following things related to the beard. And, and beard brand stood out uh, for one simple reason. When you go, I don't know if it's like this now. I think yes. But if you go, they are selling uh, beard products, so like oil and all those kind of stuff, uh, wax. But when you go to their website, they ask you, uh, what's the shape of your beard? You know, like, those kind of small things and basically based on that they give you personalized experience of what product you need for yourself so kind of like a quiz that gets you engaged on the website and then basically of course you are more willing to to engage with them and to buy additionally to that uh they uh basically have a barbershop when they uh, record conversation with people, uh, you know, going to trim their beard or get a haircut or whatever it is. Uh, and they cre create the whole narrative around that, you know, how beard is healthy, what are some things you need to do around it. So the product becomes the obvious thing that you need to buy. So, you know, one more thing that, that they learn from B2C that we can now implement into the B2B because uh, if we create demand, the website becomes just the, the outlet. When you go, uh, you have everything ready for you because you already know that you want to buy from them and you need to have uh, a frictionless experience to click the I want to buy now. And that's the only moment when you get to talk to the sales. And not only a frictionless experience, also adding also delightful moments in that experience, exactly. as well, which is exactly. extremely important to have like delightful moments. Many thanks, uh, Nemanja, for your complex and sophisticated thoughts on, on demand gen as well. But I was curious just from my pure <clears throat> curiosity as well. So on one hand, you have the demand gen kind of uh, uh, alignment and strategy and narratives. But do you do any, any active outreach towards your clients or do you have any thoughts revolving this area? Yeah, uh, we don't. Uh, it's not that I don't like it or mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. At the moment, we create enough demand so we don't need it. Uh, but... Um, if we do the demand gen right, uh, I mean, let's call it create demand because demand gen is closing the demand, damning the demand and creating the demand. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I feel like people just uh, switch from lead gen to demand gen and now calling demand gen a lead gen, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Google and you do the search for the articles, demand gen is basically lead gen mm -hmm. uh, as it is written. It's the narrative that is created by the MarTech companies. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the days. But uh, the thing is, uh, then if the marketing does their job right, which is go to market and finding uh, the unfair advantage of your company and promoting it through that, basically facilitating uh, the sales process, uh, creating a relationship by giving uh, the potential customer just enough in each stage of the buyer's journey uh, so they can come to the end. Uh, that way you create the awareness, you create the brand, you are on top of mind. And even if they don't come to you right away, because maybe they are not ready to buy yet, uh, they know who you are. And when the sales team does the outreach, uh, they are not starting from minus. They are starting at least from zero because they will know the name of the company or the name of the person who has the personal brand from the company. In that way, it's much easier for them to get first the response and then to get into the, the communication. Another thing is if uh, marketing is doing their job uh, well, you don't need like 10 
20, 30 salespeople in the company. You know, if you create MQLs, you need them to, you know, to do something with those MQLs. Uh, and basically they spend time talking with people who don't want to talk with them to sell them something that they don't want to buy. Uh, and if you marketing is doing the right job, so you have companies coming inbound, basically, uh, you need just two sales, uh, person experience one who can do the frictionless job and can actually, you know, close them and not only close them, but close bigger deals. So, uh, accelerate the sales velocity and shorten the sales cycle. Uh, so, sorry that... to cut, sorry mm -hmm. to cut in through there, and and just wanted to add: uh, Are your thoughts the same if you're talking about an enterprise kind of niche product to have only to only rely on, let's say, demand gen or demand creation, as you mentioned, not also to have some kind of outreach vertical or outreach element to it in order to educate maybe better? Because in some cases, maybe the product is not even known by the customer because you're creating essentially a new thing. So you, your 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 client doesn't have any any other way to know about you or to try to find you, in a way that you need to go towards them or do a bit more a more aggressive outreach. What what are your thoughts, uh, Revolver? Yeah, that that, that was my next sentence. Uh, but okay. basically, you explained the need for demand gen for creating yeah. demand. What you said, there is a need for creating demand, not for doing the outreach. But you can create demand through doing the outreach as well. So uh, what what I said is like you can have two. Salesperson actually, you know, not investing much time talking with people who don't want to buy from them and convincing them. Uh, basically, they they talk to like two of them coming this month, for example, for the enterprise, uh, you know, huge clients, and they have time to go and do the outreach. So create demand in a different way, not to do what marketing is doing. So marketing shouldn't do like digital sales; they should do marketing, and sales can then do the sales. They can do mm -hmm. the outreach. And try to create, uh, you know, uh, ba basically the best salespeople are now thinking like marketeers and they know they need to create demand for themselves to get into the conversation with these people. And, you know, doing the outreach is the same thing as if you are creating for the company. Yeah, that's you what know. I want to say. What, what, what would you say to one of those salespersons? Um, do you have any practical or actual actual activities uh, which you recommend what do you see working now how they should what actually concrete uh, steps should they take those kind of sales people uh what's working now for example let's take linkedin uh what's working is uh that you actually create create a personal brand for yourself uh you don't do it if somebody from the company tells you you do it because uh you need you know that it's important. You know that it's not the, the first and the last company you're going to work in because you will need it long term. Uh, and basically you talk. Uh, it can go two ways. First one is you, you talk about what the company does. So explain, talk about the product, the but from the customer's perspective, how does it help them? Uh, and, and the second thing is uh, you talk about sales because that's what you know. The modern sales, how does it develop? How does it go? So you, you show that you know your job on one way and you get to know the way you solve the potential customer's problem. So, uh, and you mix it all up with personal stories, with all those things that, uh, that are uh, unique for you. Uh, the thing is uh, that is kind of interesting here is, uh, you know, if you are good at your job, uh, you can easily go and share some tips and tricks that can easily get attraction on LinkedIn, right? Because you get you can share lists. How do you prepare? How do you do you prospecting? How do you communicate with customers? And, and I like to do like for example, if the co you have the content piece, you post content, then you need to engage to have like uh, you know insightful comments. It's enough to leave one for a day that will be like wow. I didn't expect that. That's a completely new, uh, new insights, completely new perspective. And it needs to be, um, an additional value that will make that post better. So that person will feel uh, like, you know, you, you will actually empowering them. Uh, also connect with people who are already active, not going to search on LinkedIn and finding like CMO, CFOs. CTOs, whoever you're going after, but connect with people that are already active, meaning 
you go, for example, in, in our, uh, in my industry, go to Dave, go to Chris, go to other people and see who are people already active on their profile and try to take away that audience because they already know about the topics that you are creating. You are confident that your, uh, expertise is, uh, you know, similar. So they will react to your post as well. And we already mentioned peers are the one that are getting you the new business. So they will recommend you. Uh, and I mean, uh, my clients and us are getting uh, referred from the, from the people and companies. We have no idea who they are. Mm. Like literally like, uh, two, yeah. two days ago, a guy, a CMO in a big company just mentioned me, uh, as somebody who is helping him think out of the box. Uh, he was nominated for the award, but he says like Nemanja is one of six people that, uh, you know, that I follow and that inspire me. He never liked my post. I, I, I don't know that I'm even connected to the guy, to be honest. I, I had a post yesterday saying exactly that. Uh, and it's kind of interesting how the things go. So what happens next when you connect with them, you don't go straight forward, uh, to, you know, to pitching them with something. Uh, I usually wait for two weeks or a month. So giving them time to consume the content. Uh, while that's happening, I'm engaging with them. And after that time, I'm sending them a message. Uh, all depends now. People do short messages, longer ones, but just to get to know them. You know, like uh, sometimes I just say, hey, hey, I just wanted to say hi. You know, literally just that. Uh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of things, different things happen. Sometimes I was in a situation that like the next message was back and we schedule a call. And I was like, yeah. that was, too, that was too fast. That, that was too so, easy. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I asked, I asked that, that, that women, uh, that woman, uh, you know, how, uh, what happened? Cause I, I was curious, like that was too fast. And she <laughs> said, you know, she was head of, uh, head of product, uh, and they fired the CMO. So they were, uh, looking for somebody, an agency or a person to come in and help them with marketing. Um, I added the, her somewhere, uh, during that time. Um, she saw my post, uh, it was kind of interesting to her. She saw who was engaging with the post. Those were the people that she trusted on LinkedIn. She's following them. Then she looked at mutual connections. She saw, uh, my experience and that was enough for her to schedule a conversation. Yeah. It's all those little touch points that you, you aren't really seeing, you aren't really aware of, but they're happening in the background. Exactly. And when you actually start to engage, they're already so far down the funnel than you would imagine. It makes a lot of sense. I think the, um, yeah, the challenging thing is, is like balancing all of these things together. It, like the demand creation and brand marketing have such crossover as well and, and how you try and work on those strategies together. And like what Dragosh is talking about with regards to more the enterprise level and partnerships level is how can you integrate that also with the, with the brand marketing, the kind of brand building that you're doing. Um, so that the things aren't just like, you know, separate entities happening in little silos, but it's all happening as a collaborative thing. It's really interesting. And one thing I really liked um, from Demand 22, the metadata events, I can't remember who it was from now. Um, it was it was from a CEO of, and I can't rem rem remember the company, but he talked about how he had basically shifted his focus from um, generating leads to generating a pool. And that pool is the people who are there inside your community, listening to what you're saying, learning about you, digging a bit deeper. And, you know, when they're ready, they kind of pop out of that pool and then they become a kind of qualified lead. It's really interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, look, at, look at the podcast uh, as an example. Like usually the, 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 the agency, the marketers will say, go for the advertising first, right? That's the most straightforward to get, to get the, 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 the customers or go for the outbound. Right. Uh, I would go and invite them to be a guest on our podcast. Cause like, if you have sales, you have it, the list of like 50 to hundred people, uh, are your ideal clients and there, there isn't getting better than that. Uh, them coming, uh, to your show, uh, you having conversation with them, asking them, how is the buying process going? How are they making decisions inside the company? Do they already have a vendor? Are they already using a product? How much would they pay? for something like that um, and basically using that episode to create a relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, they are included in creating and distributing it. And also from that episode, you get uh, pieces that you can use to kind of communicate with other people from the list who are in different stages of the buyer's journey based on the questions that you ask them. 
Uh, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's easy. What I wanted to say uh, about sales, marketing and enterprise level companies, you need both. But the thing is, marketing is one that sets up the, the foundation uh, and creates the growth. Sales is here to take the growth and accelerate it uh, on the next level. What does it mean when you start the company? Marketing is there to help you create the narrative and the story and it happens while you are building the product. Not for the most companies, 90% of them, uh, except those few that are highly successful, basically they add marketing afterwards as, as an expense uh, when they want to get more sales, right? But usually marketing is there. If you have the great narrative, if you have the great story, if you have the great sales decks that sales team can use, uh, you are basically making it easy for sales to do their job. You know, and they can try it out the marketing things uh, and see, you know, if those messages really stick. Is the messaging right? Is the positioning right? They can, you know, do the outbound call potential uh, customers and actually try to see what's happening with that. I can give yeah. you an, an, an example. Like um, we were uh, questioning if uh, we are need to go with with one startup from from turkey uh if we do we need to go uh for one category or uh how are actually the customers perceiving us so uh well, luckily we didn't have to go to the to the calls because the product team was talking to the customers and also the customer success team were talking with them from a different perspective we can listen to the calls so we we told them to kind of ask the questions how do they um call our product you know how do they go to search for it like uh it was uh, the company's user guiding i can say their name uh they go uh, and they have you know uh, onboard users they are no code tool they are also like project management all kind of different stuff and they got all those uh information all those answers from from the customers and they found out okay so there's no um consistent it's not consistent what they're saying it's not one category maybe we should just quit that thoughts and rank for like six different categories and to be able to do that we need to make a shift so they uh they got the investment and they created the media team inside the company uh and now if you go and you type in all those things that i mentioned like user onboarding user guiding project management, you will see user guiding in one of top five positions from Google with content. So uh, we help them establish the foundation and then, you know, uh, onboard uh, some content marketers. Now they are having the engine inside the company that is helping them grow. Yeah, just quickly to, to add also, I want to touch upon what Matt mentioned, actually having a pool instead of actually having a funnel. And I think he, he was referring to, to Patrick Campbell from ProfitWell, which... Yeah, they actually, Patrick is doing things so well. Exactly, because they actually transformed their inbound marketing and becoming a media-only company. Yeah, and actually yeah. what you mentioned as well. So having also doubling down on the media efforts or having actually a small department, the media department inside a company, okay, composed from, from marketing people, from maybe even with the sales people, from customer success people, and get, get these uh, uh, efforts uh, going. I think- Yeah, there, there, is, there is one thing related to, to Patrick that I want to mention, which will be useful for the listeners, is, I mean, you know, they're actually doing it with a couple of podcasts and they really got into the media thing. And one thing they are doing differently from the others is when they go to the conference or they, they buy a booth, or, you know, most companies are doing it for the list of the uh, um, of the participants, right? And a chance to kind of be there. And if somebody comes to the uh, to the booth, they can have a conversation with. But Patrick and his team are actually establishing uh, another stage on their booth and basically recording the podcast episodes over there. So like, so nice, man. basically, it's additional stage, your stage. Exactly. Nothing is more interesting than that on those booths. Right. So, sounds, uh, so they nice, record yeah. it over there. They have the audience, they have the speakers. Uh, I mean, speakers are available to them. They're just right there. So they didn't yeah. need to go and look for them. Exactly. What, what, what? Sorry guys. It just, it just dropped out. Did, you, did I disappear from you? Cause my internet yeah. went yeah. and I, I've come back in, but, but just no carry worries. on and we'll, we'll, no we'll ignore it. 
just to quickly sum up basically what what uh, Nemanja said that about Patrick Campbell from Profit. Well, you, you remember Patrick uh, from Demand Gen 2020. Yeah, yeah. He said actually having yeah. not op- not a booth at the at for in- for instance at the Web Summit or at any other convention, but actually having a podcast recording studio and doing episodes from from there. And actually, we discovered this 100%. on our exactly. We discovered this actually on our factual experience on on the ground on the uh, yeah yeah hundred uh, percent. I think inter- that's inter- the, interacting. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say I think that's a really interesting thing about everything yeah. we've said today is, you know, Nemanja's talked a lot about this community shift, right? There's so many, like, communities now, B2B, SaaS communities, these kind of things. And so everyone seems to be on the same page. You know, I'm sure there's so many B2B communities that are still in this legacy stage, still don't really understand what's going on in in the kind of modern marketing, um, you know, mix or anything. But within the kind of communities that we're a part of, everyone's on the same page. And then the challenge that then comes up is then how do you actually make that happen? We know... Um, personal brand we know um, the media strategy we know creating the pool we know all of these things it's then how do you within your team um, create that balance whereby you can optimize you know how you're operating in each of those little areas and how the whole thing is also tied together because I think now because everyone's on that same page the ones that succeed are going to be the ones that find the the kind of right recipe and the right uh, ingredients to make it happen, you know, better than everybody else. It's, it's not just enough now to say, hey, we're going to do a media strategy and hey, we're going to, you know, focus on um, brand and demand gen and self-attribution, and all, all these things that everyone's doing. You have to do it in a unique and really, you know, strong way. I, I totally agree. Uh, and I think um, there are two or three things that I want to mention here. Uh, first one is, you know, you need to do a great customer research. You need to be excellent yeah. and that and need, uh, you know, kind of lives up everything. Basically from that, you can do reverse engineering and that's marketing. You know how to sell to those people because you get too deep into that. You know how to differentiate because you have done the market research and the customer research extremely well. You know, you, you know uh, what your customers are doing. You don't, you can look at the competitors, uh, but if you look at them, the possibility is as it coming down to the most of companies, what they are doing is you will copy something, you know, mm-hmm. from them. Yeah. But if you go and get to know the customers and that's your start, then you will be able to, to differentiate you know, and do some things, some things differently. And uh, uh, to give you kind of the example, I think we were one of the first, they started the podcast and had this uh, headline and transcription, uh, you know, in a short videos that we are distributing. But then we saw everybody's yeah. doing that. So we actually added an old TV frame and we were in a TV frame, we were sharing the, the smaller videos. And it, it, it got interesting. Then we also saw, aha, uh-huh, there is an intro that we can add that is also old school. In that way, it shares the narrative when we start the podcast. So we also did that. Uh, and basically, I'm following when people start doing the same things, when they zig, we zag. And we go in diff- It doesn't have to be a bigger, uh, you know, shift, a bigger differentiation. It can be, you know... Everybody ha- are using two colors. You use the third one, right? It it all depends. Uh, you know, it can be something small, but it is something that will make you. You know, if you go to to uh, LinkedIn, like everybody has the same colors, you use the color that nobody has. You are the one that got the eyeballs on you. And how we're, do we're you currently, do um, all those things? Uh huh. I was going to say we're currently in the process of 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 working on our new color palette for the for the for the new rebrand next year, and this is exactly the same thought process. Which is okay. There are some things which are recognizable to be B two B SaaS and this kind of thing. There are some things which are emerging. How do we differentiate without kind of losing the trust element of our identity or the um, what's the word the kind of um, um, professional element of of who we are. It's, it's always a difficult and balance family. to stand out, but also kind of fit in. Exactly, be familiar and standing out in the same in the same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, yeah. Uh, I got my uh, my color palette and the whole uh, you know brand design thing from a guy, an old friend who actually uh, I was listening on a conference back in the days, and he said that thing like 
the first time I heard it, it was from him. Uh, Don't chase the money, let the money chase you. And he saw what I was doing with funky marketing. He knew me before. Uh, He's also into drum and bass music, funk music, those kind of things. He just sent me the logo one day. I I made it for you. You know, he's also then sent me the T-shirt. Here is the design. You need to have the new one. Like a couple of days ago, he sent me another one. It's time to get the new one. You know, and he just saw it. And it's also, you know, like relationship you have with people, demand and how are things things happening. But I want to say, how do you establish all of that by having a process, by having a guardrails uh, and by not overthinking things? I think we all have a yeah. job because uh, so many companies overthink things. That's what I'm saying to my team every day. Uh, and I like to keep it simple. Like this is what we need to, uh, this is the results that we need to have on a yearly level. This is when we break it down. This is what we need to do on a six month in a six months. This is what we need to do in three months to get to that first three months, uh, a quarter. What we need to do is, uh, you know, what are some three things, for example, that we need to ship this month to get the results. It can be event, it can be uh, a new feature or a new product, uh, or it can be like four, ep- <coughs> four podcast episodes. Doesn't matter. And we need to know what are some things that we are tracking because like marketing and everything we do related to that should be kind of uh, look at the thesis, kind of like research development department that is actually, you know, getting your results and you shift it into the next level only when you have specific results that you said that you're going to get from that. Not before that. Yeah. You can try out, doesn't matter how you set up uh, in what time frame, but that's mm-hmm. up to you. And, and then basically, because like, except the product, I think marketing is the only thing that can get you millions in the revenue in time. The sales cannot get you that if you don't have the marketing yeah. that is helping them uh, actually establish that. But sorry, Nemanja, since you mentioned yeah. the structuring of, of the efforts of the team, I wanted to just quickly ask you, in or what are your uh, ways to go about structuring uh, the activities of your team? In what detail are you looking at uh, structuring those, those uh, activities? Or what actual tools do you use? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, look, I try to have as small team as possible. And I think that's the most important uh, thing for every company. Every, if you look at every huge company right now, they, they try to have as small team as possible for the longest as possible. Uh, and it helps you stay, you know, uh, stay Agile. in one piece, basically. Right, right. Agile, but also having people that care about what, what you are doing. Uh, and, uh, the thing is that, um, when we started the growth in the first year, um, we started getting people in team and, and I was like, wait, do I want to do this or no? I don't want to be like just, uh, an agency. I want to be, uh, a consulting plus agency so I can go to the, and talk to the C level and come from strategic level. So I need to have. Only the teams that are uh, only the people in the team that uh, can actually perform, right? Uh, and I, and to be able to do that, I need to have a small team. So uh, also, I didn't want to have clients which I will have just uh, because I need to pay people, right? I need to. I don't didn't want to work with the clients which I don't like. So, uh, I need, needed to make that switch and to be able to do that. One thing that helped me a lot, uh, was for example, Jasper is the AI tool, uh, for content writing. Basically it's one thing, uh, you know, people say it replaces content writing. No, but it makes them a strategist. Yeah. Right. Basically, uh, you know, uh, they need to come up with input and engage it. Uh, and it's, it makes wonders. It makes really wonders. I would recommend it to anybody. Another thing, uh, I didn't want to go a- and buy some complex project management tools, those kind of things. I went straight to the base camp because I know the founders. I respect their work. That was the reason. Uh, and basically as, um, a single person starting a company, that was the most obvious, uh, thing because they have, uh, a free, uh, 
part of the base camp for the personal use when you can add multiple projects. Uh, and it's still something that we are using right now with, with five people in the team. That's just enough for us. It has integration with, with G Drive, with all the things that we need it to be integrated. Uh, and I try not to use a lot of technology, right? I was using GetResponse for the emails uh, and those kind of things. Uh, but I try not to invest in a lot of things. Jasper is $190 per month. So it's not, it's not a cheap tool but it replaces a person or two persons in the content team, right? So in that way, it's, uh, it's something that pays off. Uh, and you know, you can do affiliate and you can pay off uh, the cost of that. So uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting. I feel like most companies basically go and they try to solve the problems by investing in, in tools. You know, we're going to buy this technology. We're going to buy this tool and it's going to solve us, especially you now ABM these days, you know, like, which is the best ABM to be what the best invest in the best, right? But it's not like that. What I say before about the processes about how things uh, works, you first need to have a hypothesis. You need to try it out. You need to have a process. You need to get process to deliver results uh, consistently. And then you invest in a tool to accelerate those things, to automate what you can and to take it to the next level. That's the one time when you invest in a tool and, and you go on with that. When it, when it comes to your website, so you, you mentioned a little bit about how, you know, you kind of get demand from Google searches, you've optimized, you know, certain elements of the content on your website, this kind of thing. Um, you get a lot of your clients directly through your website and how much effort as a team do you put into, um, you know, thinking about the, the content, the, the kind of conversion process, um, you know, the messaging, these kind of things on your website. Is, is it a big focus for you or it's, it's kind of secondary? Um, to tell you the truth, uh, we don't have that many people on the website, but they come and they visit specific, uh, specific articles on the website. What helps us is uh, basically um, republishing or, uh, you know, uh, how they call it today, like uh, syndicating. Dev or medium. Yeah. So it's basically one click. It uh, has three minutes. The articles are great. So publications like Startup Stash reach out to me and say, you go with one more click, you can add it to our publication and we will share it because it's great. So that's how we get uh, additional exposure. And it's no brainer, something that takes three minutes. Right. And basically, when they publish it to their platform, it's still my name, it's still my article. Uh, and it's the article that's coming from the website. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is we, they come to the website only when they want to convert. Or sometimes, you know, they read the articles, uh, but reading the articles is not really something that gets them to convert. So we need to get better at that part. Also, like what we need to get better is like we are getting a lot of traction for like B2B SaaS marketing strategies or uh, B2B strategies for tech startups, for those kind of keywords. Uh, and the thing is, we are based in Serbia, so we need to invest a lot more to be ranked for those articles in US as well. Uh, and we just started investing more, more in, in that part of the thing. But the conversion is one thing that is making us the problem. Um, you know, like people that are seeing it uh, in Google and people that are clicking through and coming to the website. So that is something that we definitely need to improve because basically we focus on the feed, uh, no matter if it's like Twitter or if it's something else, we focus on a, on a podcast. So we create the best content possible and then we have the process for distribution. So basically we know what we do pre, uh, launching, uh, a blog or a podcast episode, we know what we do after that. And, uh, you know, it gets all the traction and that distribution actually creates the SEO as well. Uh, one thing that I know is that, you know, that, uh, conversion rate now, uh, went a little bit lower as I told you that like people start coming from Google. So basically it's not the man that we are creating. It's people that already have the buying intent are, uh, you know, problem where they're looking for a solution. Um, so like before that, uh, with people only coming from the demand that we are creating, like the conversion was around 90%. Cause 
because uh, they come to us when they are ready to buy and I uh, usually have a conversation with them. I send them around like 20 questions to ask them all kinds of things that will help me find out what are exactly they, they need. So those are the things like uh, one thing that I mentioned, how do you call our product? If they don't buy from you or the competitors, uh, where uh, what do they do? Uh, if, uh, how do you define the MQL, the SQL, uh, or sales accepted lead? What happens if somebody clicks on the main, uh, CTA on the website? Um, what happens after that? Who takes that marketing or sales? Like if somebody clicks on demo, who takes that? What happens, you know, inside it? Nobody knows all the answers, but us and them both see what are some things that are missing and that they can improve. And when they send them the, the offer, I usually send it uh, along with a video. So basically, I was using Gloom. Now I'm using Drift uh, video. Uh, and I record myself going through the offer. And I explain every single thing in it. Uh, I send them also what's going to happen in the next three, three months, in the first three months uh, of our cooperation. And then basically, they don't have a space to ask questions, right? They can see my face. They can see if I'm excited working with them, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and basically it works, uh, you know, perfectly. Super stuff. So since we are at the website uh, subject or the website subject, do you have any favorite websites <clears throat> when you're looking at the B2B industry or <clears throat> maybe do you have any benchmark in, benchmarks in your mind at the moment? For yeah. The B2B, uh... Maybe even SaaS companies, maybe even focus on SaaS companies, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I feel I feel like SaaS companies all have the same website, which which I dislike the the design and the look. It's it's all the same with illustration with, with those kind of things. So I don't have uh, the only one that I have, and actually uh, I want to copy something from them and implement that. Uh, it's metadata. We mentioned them. Uh, I like how they structure the part the part or the podcast part when they have like specific page for the podcast and then have, it basically goes like blog when they have, uh, you know, embedded links and everything for the uh, single episode. We were doing kind of the same thing in the beginning. When we switched the website, we didn't get back to that because uh, we didn't have time to yeah. take care of that. Now we are going to that. And this is exactly the, the benchmark that I'm looking at that I want to use. They also have a different design. Mm. You know, if you look at other SaaS companies and you look at metadata, it's obvious that, you know, the difference. Mm. Uh, and yeah. uh, one, one thing I like uh, is also like the CXL team, Pep Laya and the other guys, like a couple of friends of mine are working over there. Martin, who was working um, with me, is is now working at Spiro. So the agency that is a, a part of the, the whole uh, CXL infrastructure. Basically, he was, uh, if you go, uh, like Serbian guys are running the, the CXL newsletters, right? Like for CXL, it's Ognjen uh, Boskovic. If it's uh, for Spiro, it's Martin that was working with me. And basically the thing is, uh, he's doing the same things as we've done here. Because like, to give you an example, we didn't want to, uh, to have like a regular newsletter. We wanted to have a newsletter, which is a little bit different. So I told him, Martin, you are now Master Martin. You are not Martin, you are Master Martin. That's how you're gonna uh, <laughs> approach the email. That's that's your, your name when you're writing the newsletter. And we have another girl, Linda. So one week it was Martin and he was writing it just like his diary. So I woke up, ah, it's cloudy outside, but uh, you know, I need to write to you this email to tell you a couple of things and help you and help me get my day better, those kind of things. And the next week, Linda comes in, Martin is in Serbia, Linda is in Spain. She have a different perspective from the sea, looking at sun, looking at all those different stuff. Uh, so right now he's implementing, you know, something similar in Spiro and running their uh, LinkedIn company page, running the newsletter and those kind of things. So, uh, but what I like with them is they're focused on the customers. They have the Facebook group, which they use uh, to kind of get the insights. So, and then based on the feedback, they implement, they get the new courses, they implement things, um, and they try to look at now was the C uh, CXL live. Like if you look at the visual, uh, 
Martin uh, also created that. Basically, it's like a movie. You know, if you look at the Marvel movies, it's, you know, like a big tree with, with all those people over there. They got the speakers uh, position like that on the visuals. So, and the whole website was, uh, was created like that. So, uh, also something that, uh, that you, know, you can look from different industries and try to implement for yourself. I always like to go back to the, to the music, uh, to sports, to those kind of things, see the example and then implement it into the B2B tech. Yeah, that's the interesting concept yeah. we also saw on, at Lisbon, in, at the Web Summit in Lisbon, actually getting concepts from B2C, for instance, and implementing it into, into B2B. Sorry, Matt, you wanted to say something as well. Sorry. I was just going to say, it's, it's in, yeah, I completely agree with what the manual says with regards to how B2B websites, and not only websites, but ads and, and social pages, they all look the same, right? And it, it's always like, you know, you can tell it's a SaaS website immediately. And I think the thing that metadata have done so well, I'm, I'm also a bit of a fanboy of metadata, um, is that it's, they've, they've obviously focused on design and the subtle meaning behind what they're doing. And they've made it really a part of how they're growing rather than just kind of saying, yeah, we need some kind of color palette. Yes, we need some kind of brand guidelines. They've really thought about it. And if you look at their, their new website that they kind of launched with this whole no BS um, uh, OS, or whatever it's called, um, which they launched just after that Demand 22 event, they have such simplistic like um, menus, you know, it's like black on white and the call to action is the same. And the imagery is also very similar, but very bold as well. And it's almost like they've kind of actually had that conversation that a lot of B2B companies don't have, which is how do we make sure that our, our visual identity actually matches what we're trying to represent from a, from a product and positioning perspective. And so I think, yeah, it's, um, it's certainly something that I like to try and give attention towards and uh, it's, it's, I think it's something that can really make you stand out quite quickly if you just hone the messaging really specific to, you know, who you are, what kind yes. of um, personality you want your brand to have. And then you match the visual identity alongside that as well. You reminded me now, uh, I'm, actually, I didn't think of that. But now that you mentioned all bullshit and metadata website, you know, the feeling is uh, like the, the, the visuals, they're just slapping at you. Right. If you yeah. go through the website, it's feel like, whoosh, you know, it's something. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the interesting thing with metadata is, you know, they were having a high frequency of their ads on LinkedIn. So uh, meaning every day I woke up and I see there the same image with the same copy, with the same ad in the feed on LinkedIn. And, and you know, I'm usually not the guy who goes bitching around those things, but, uh, you know, when you see it for like two months every day, then it, you kind of had enough. So I wrote them a comment, you know, like, hey, guys, um, maybe you would like to change the visual on this one. I'm seeing it for two months in the feed. <laughs> or give us or give us some variation. Yeah, <laughs> they, they didn't they didn't do anything for another month and a half, I think, or two months, something like that. And then they, they made a post or somebody from the team made a post when they say uh, something about that topic. You know, what you should do. And I was like, maybe you should go and check out your ads. You know, because I left the comment <laughs> two months ago. And nothing changed. I'm still seeing the ad. And then, you know, uh, they were acting like human, you know. Like, uh, they they uh, responded to my comment on the ad and say, Hey, Nivanya, thanks. You know, life is hard. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just <laughs> carry, carry the, carried away with things. And, you know, don't hate us. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had a very similar experience with them because after Demand 22, there was one conversation between Jason Widdup, the VP Marketing, uh, and then the CEO, and then also uh, Mark Huber. I'm not sure ex exactly what role he has, but there was like three of them discussing together. And um, they were kind of laughing at the fact that Jason was saying, yes, we're like now a media first company. And they were saying, wow, we, we never expected you to get to this stage where you would embrace that. And I wrote a comment about that that um, kind of recording and said, you know, Jason's kind of talking about being a media first company now, like it's a new thing for him. But the conversational ad was a huge thing that he had um, months ago. And that was almost a start of being a media company because his face was out there. He was talking to people. So I said the line between yeah. where they distinguished, you know, we're a demand company. No, we're a media company. Now we're moving towards this. I said, it's kind of a little bit blurred. 
And his response to this whole message I wrote about that, um, you know, thing was, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. Absolutely. Uh, I'm writing some notes. I'll go back and think about that and try and, you know, define more where we kind of change our strategy. And you're right. It's just being like bold um, in terms of your brand, but also in terms of like your own presence, um, having a presence, talking to people. Um, it just generates that um, that um, willingness for other people to engage with you. And then you're naturally in a position to engage back and it just all feels very organic and natural. But of course, there's a strategy behind that. And, it's, and for them, it's working really well. Yeah, I mean, um, just to kind of get back to the website, one, one thing is, uh, are people actually consuming the content? You know, that is for me the most important thing. Are they actually reading what you have on the website? You know, are they go maybe the, they don't need to convert right away, but are they actually consuming the content? You know, the same thing goes for the social media. Are they consuming it in the feed, right? Uh, and the, the interesting thing is when we la first launched the, the Funky Marketing website, the first version, we had a lot of comment, uh, a lot of content over there, a lot of text uh, on the whole website. And the comment I got from designers, from everybody is, you know, that time has passed to have a lot of text on the website. You, you know, everybody likes to do it uh, e-commerce way, you know, short text, a lot of visuals, those kind of things. Um, and I told them, okay, let's let's wait and see. Because we were doing something new, you know, like talking about, uh, you know, creating demand, demand generation, the, the differences. And I wanted to educate people. We didn't have blog posts. We didn't have at the time the, the podcast. So the website was the only real content that we had except, uh, you know, social media posts. So mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at Hotjar and measuring how people are reacting like they were going like they do with a pencil, with a mouse, and going line by line, yeah. like literally. Th that's the heat map that I saw. Yeah. And I'm like, look at this. Like they're actually reading the content on the homepage, on the About Us page, you know, reading the things and then reaching reaching out to us. So, uh, you know, all you always need to find a way to get to know uh, your customers and to get, if you also one thing that is important, if you're going into different markets, different, uh, demographically, you need to know how people are behaving in those countries. That is something, uh, yeah. that I learned, uh, when I first started working in Serbia, because I, I been working in us, Canada, and then in Serbia, I had to learn how to talk about marketing in Serbia. And it was kind of funny, but, um, but basically, we were working with a huge uh, accounting software company, Slovenian one that had uh, that was working in Serbia, in Croatia, also in different countries. But in Slovenia, they had like uh, animations, you know, a, a pig that is actually, you know, uh, pooping the money, right? Those kind of things. Uh, and it was working really well because Slovenians are totally different than us from you know, outside of ex-Yugoslavia, Slovenians are very different. Uh, in Serbia, when I when I checked it out, like every visuals that we have, I was new in the company, so I was checking out what's happening over there. Like we had people in suits all over the, the visuals, people in suits, like a guy in suit mm -hmm. in a boat, a guy in suit on the ladders going to the moon, like all those, uh, you know, stock images from Google. And I asked the, the owner, like, yeah. Why are we doing this? Like uh, coming from US and Canada, it's coming, you know, more natural. People don't want stock photos, those kind of things. He was like, we tried everything. Try it on your own. We have a freedom to do that. Try it on your own and see how it's working. So I switched. I post the natural photo of the team or uh, from a meeting, something like that, like up to five likes on Facebook. It was 2019. So Facebook was still huge. Uh, then I switched back. To, uh, to people in suits, like not 500, but 1,500 likes, 500 comments. People were killing each other in, in the comments. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, obviously people from Serbia look at the accountants as, you know, uh, men in suit. That's it. You, you don't get away from yeah. that. So, uh, you know, Extremely important when you're creating a website, when you're creating the content, whatever it is, so that you are not the one who is deciding what's good and what's bad. You are the one who is creating the content with 
insights that you have from the customers and then letting them decide what's good or what's bad. Super stuff. I yeah. uh, really appreciate your, your, your key takeaways from, from this uh, Nemanja. And maybe it's time to switch gears a bit into the analytics kind of, uh, kind of discussions. And I would like to ask you if we have maybe top three key indicators which uh, you are looking at when you're launching a campaign or on a daily basis or more frequent, which and which are those uh, uh, KPIs you're looking at? Yeah, let's uh, let's check it out. Like for us, basically, we're a small team and we need to, don't need to go that deep when it comes to those things. But I separate uh, differently how we're closing demand, how we're creating demand. So basically, closing demand will tell us that we have conversions from direct traffic, from LinkedIn, from those kind of things. Um, creating demand is going to tell us what actually happened in those channels. So uh, then trying to see if our efforts are working, depending on what are people telling us in, in those forms. Then uh, if we take it uh, to, the, to the podcast and following who's listening, uh, from which countries are they responding? Do we get the feedback in engagement of the people via Sorry, email? What platforms, when... what platforms are you on when, when you're talking about the plat- uh, podcast? Uh, podcast, yeah. Uh, YouTube and then Anchor yeah. to distribute it to all the other platforms. But oh, majority yeah. of listeners are coming from, uh, from Apple Podcasts because like the, it's B2B tech. Uh, most uh, advanced audience is in the US, so they are listening to, to the Apple Podcast. Also, you have a you have a chance to get the reviews uh, on on Apple Podcasts. You don't have that on Spotify or some yeah. other channels. Uh, so that's that's kind of kind of interesting. Also, what's uh, what's interesting like YouTube is great for branding, and YouTube is harder to get the audience uh, to subscribe because most of the people on YouTube are just watching; they don't subscribe. So you need to engage additionally. To get to get them to subscribe and to build it up, uh, and for us, it's a channel that that I have even before I built Funky Marketing, so it was inactive for a while. Now YouTube punishes that, and there are a lot of things out there. Uh, but like, uh, I finally I'm investing in YouTube SEO, so things are starting to happen. Um, also, one thing uh, that I mentioned, so we are following what's happening, uh, if the right people are engaging. Uh, we are following the feedback that we get from those things. Uh, I'm following also uh, the relationship that I'm building with these people, what's happening afterwards. Are we doing something together? Are we working yeah. together? M- you know, maybe we support each other, uh, recommend each other, whatever it is. I need, I want to have a specific outcome that's coming that's coming out of it. You know, I think the only one that, that I don't have the outcome with was the Rory Sutherland, but it's, you know, he got us the most views. So that's, that's the outcome that I wanted. Right. And he's the only one that, that was able to talk about biases in B2B, how a decision being made because, you know, people are scared for their jobs or, you know, those kind of things. Uh, and besides that, uh, if we take it, uh, Look, I'm looking at the traffic on the website as well, but I, uh, when I see that we have conversions like uh, 10 to 15 at, uh, per month, I don't care about the traffic. I know that we have the right people yeah. coming to the website to convert. I know that it's working. Uh, also uh, on LinkedIn, what I follow is uh, what's happening after I post. So uh, who's coming to my profile? Uh, are those the right people? Who's commenting? Who's, uh, who are the followers that I get after the post? Do I get the followers? You know, those kind of things. Uh, also on the company page, I look at uh, how big is the reach and who are the people that started to engage in the comments because that is the place when we share like small videos uh, and with guests on the podcast. So basically we mentioned them, they, we share it. And it started to get to get a buzz from that on Instagram. I don't care about anything. It's just additional channel. Let's try to see how, how it works. Um, one thing that's, that's important to me is uh, I follow how are the existing customers responding and are they engaging in the content on LinkedIn as well. So not only the acquisition part, but also retention because um, 
it's not a small number of times when somebody who is a resisting client reached out and said, uh, hey, Nemanja, I saw uh, you were doing this with this in this company. You shared that on LinkedIn. Maybe, you know, what do you think is the good thing for us as well? So we extend the lifetime value of a client with that. We get uh, to upsell them additional service. So in that way, it's extremely important uh, to follow also, also those things, the feedback. Uh, and it's not small number of times. When, for example, uh, it's not a metric that you can follow somewhere. But, you know, if you talk to a client, for example, you meet once a week or whatever it is, and you see them writing all the time. Maybe, you know, uh, it's additional service that you can add them, that they can have you as a consultant if you are just here for the agency work, right? Because not uh, also not small number of times when I ask them, what are you writing? And they tell me, Nemanja, you are sharing so many gems here in this like uh, half an hour, 45 minutes that we have together. I don't uh, think I'm able to write it all up. Uh, I think we need to uh, start recording this course. And I'm like, sure, my hour costs that much. You know, here without it, it's included inside the package. But if you want to get deeper into some topics, sure, maybe we can go and it's an additional service. So uh, trying to keep what? it simple, all in all, all, all. Yeah. Amidst all of that, um, you know, all these different areas that you're focused on, um, both kind of individually, uh, you know, as Nemanja, and also in terms of funky marketing as well, what would you say are a few kind of areas you're focused on going into 2023? Like things you want to learn more about, things you want to try to uh, utilize a bit more, things you want to try and focus on more within your team. Um, what would you say that, you know, is kind of on your plate next year to try to um, improve yeah. and, and focus on and, and, and to help you grow even further? Yeah, I lost you for a second, but I think I got, I got the question. So uh, going forward, uh, one of a couple of things that I want to, uh, to do more is uh, be involved more in change management is the hardest part, part when you switch the business models. So lead gen to demand gen or whatever it is, the switch, lining the teams, the change management is the hardest part. And, you know, um, I'm kind of hot on doing the, the you know, the, the crazy difficult things, um, you know, just like doing the copywriting or writing things. It's not something that excites me. So uh, I want to get more into that part. Uh, what I'm figuring out is we are right now building all the processes for the funky marketing that we maybe didn't have. So uh, I will probably have somebody to, uh, to basically, uh, I don't know, there are a couple of names for that, but to be in charge of the team and all the processes so I can, you know, be in charge of the strategy and sales and keep, uh, you know, bringing the new business to the company uh, at the same time i'm doing something related to this but in a way also different creating the community uh the the basically the business network here in Novi Sad and then will spread out uh, online uh, and as well it started with the event from like 16 people then 30 uh, then we got to 200 people on each event twice uh, twice a month basically the, the people led us we proved that we have, uh, you know, as they say, the, the, the proof of concept, right? Now building it uh, as a subscription based. So people subscribe to the event, subscribe to be the part of the community. Um, and we basically get to sit down with uh, the C-level executives twice a month for start. It will be more and kind of, you know, get the additional business for that, but also help them get to the next level because like, Novi Sad is uh, slowly getting to where Romania, Romania is related to tech. Uh, you know, for example, in my street, I have uh, Epam, uh, I have Vega, I have a huge, uh, huge tech companies. Uh, everywhere you go, there are developers. So it's a, it's a great environment for that and trying also to, to have multiple income streams that are working all together with the same goal. Like my ultimate goal is to uh, help as many business professionals and companies uh, achieve their results and get better in what they do. So uh, with that in mind, I need to empower others 
to do the job for me as well because me as individual we as company you know can just do uh so much but the thing is the company is called funky marketing because the definition of funk is uh, a groove a music that makes you want to move right something that makes you activate so this is exactly the only thing that i'm trying to do i'm trying to make people uh, more active in pursuing what their goals are you know and kind of like giving them the direction to go over there <laughs> and empowering them to do that super stuff Sounds and, great. Uh, and really really appreciate your your sharings it's time to uh, step to our final topic is one of the most requested topics uh, from from our clients and from our audience i, I, I like is... i like it that's that's a un unique one <laughs> it's a very unique one it's top five things you decide so pick whatever five things you're passionate about i see all of the books in your background maybe it's books maybe some other thing just give us your top five things you decide yeah le let's go the first one that you see over there is marcus uh, aurelius uh, and there is one thing that uh, actually guides me through the life. I don't have a tattoo of it, but it's the book that I come uh, every couple of days, and it's the book that you never stop reading. Um, Meditations from Marcus Aurelius, and basically the one thing that I uh, have from it. Uh, so uh, obstacles is the way. You know, like there are difficulties, there are obstacles, but obstacle needs to become the way. That's that's the only way to go to go in life another thing related to that also from from one of the books uh something that i learned from from churchill uh and uh during the the blitzkrieg you know when the the germans bombed uh, uh britain britain needed a guy that uh easily gets out of the bad moments and of the sadness and comes to the to the light right and, and churchill was the guy who is going with uh with his gramophone with music and wine and uh you know the the cigarettes uh during the nights uh through his house with all the people over there dancing and he said one thing he looks at life the way you know it's a it's a hole with the windows on left on the right and sometimes he wants to open the window so the light comes in and instead the dark comes in so that's just the way the way life goes so we will have ups and downs but you need to focus on the bigger goal and learn how uh, you to manage yourself to get through all those things like especially us entrepreneurs it's extremely hard and you know uh, you need to know how to manage yourself through all those things the third one is if you want to uh, be successful in marketing and to really understand how it goes, get as close as possible to the customers. Meaning, you know, if you're just starting your career, go into customer service or go into direct response uh, when you will have direct communication with the customers and you can get you can get the feedback that they're they're giving right away. So there is no there is nobody in between. Right, so if you do that, uh, that will empower you and you will get a uh, clear understanding of uh, how they are behaving, how they're looking at things and so on. The fourth one is get close, uh, as close as possible to the revenue as early as possible, meaning uh, you need to have the revenue in sight. Maybe you are not responsible for the revenue, especially if you are the junior or just starting, but get as close to the revenue so you can actually optimize everything you do towards that goal you can see how everything you are doing is reflecting on the revenue or or it's not but uh, you know if you go towards that goal you will be better at marketing you will uh, know how to explain everything you do the results to the c level or somebody who is uh, you know responsible for for your work and the fifth one uh, is talk to people that's the most obvious way talk to every people that you can uh, as much as you can traveling online whatever it is because like you never know what will happen in six months it's mm. crazy out there when it comes to changes in the job positions changes in the industries you never know who will end up in which position and how you can benefit from them in the long term so don't eliminate anyone 
but uh, you know try it uh, you know looking at how much time you have try to go through the things uh one advice that i can give to people have one day a week dedicated to talking to other people have like uh calendly links for a 50 minutes call that's enough so you can talk with multiple people during the day uh you can easily schedule another one if you want go into in, in depth and uh talk with different people find out different perspective find out problems that they have uh you can do as zine blayachi is doing uh record those calls and then you have at least one gem in each call that you can use as a content uh you know going forward so that's it here it is like five stuff super stuff i would like to also to contribute great. to the churchill to the churchill trivia and add my quote also to let's uh, go you got to this yeah moving from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm especially coming from from sales i think of course you're getting the nose if maybe if it's more nose or maybe it's most nose or whoever knows but actually get it, th- this gets you closer to the yeses and this also links back to marcus aurelius as well in terms of the obstacles you you're facing in the day to day sorry matt i think you 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 wanted to add something as well well first of all that. i have to say that as a, as a as a british person i'm i'm slightly ashamed that i'm the only one who hasn't come on with a churchill quote <laughs> but no it all makes a lot of sense and we 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 usually also have the um have the question in terms of advice for young marketers but i think everything you've just said in that top 5 list is hugely valuable to younger marketers too both in terms of from the personal aspect of things in terms of how you approach life how you approach obstacles how you approach failures or perceived failures um also in terms of yeah absolutely getting close to revenue connecting with people uh, these things are also important so yeah thank you so much for all of that information i think it, it will really help a lot of people listening yeah i think it's something that uh, didn't help me actually and i feel guilty because uh, I, i you know i help others with recommending them and also guiding them through the process but the thing is when i started it all came quite naturally to me especially like writing copy i was always good at it uh, expressing my thoughts because i was reading a lot and i think it came from reading comics uh, so when i needed to train other people to do it i was like who am i to train them it's coming naturally to me yeah. but then i learned the process yeah. why i'm good at it why did i learn from these things you know so so uh, another thing for everybody listening like try to simplify everything simple doesn't mean easy but try to simplify it and see which are the steps that you need to take to get to the goal mm-hmm. yeah it's funny it's it's yeah. almost like um the uh, the like the english language right because i'm english obviously um and i've worked in a lot of countries working in english language but with people who are who are non native speakers and often they will ask me for advice yeah, in terms of english speaking in terms of english writing and because obviously it comes natural to me because <laughs> i grew up in england it's almost like i find it hard to give that advice because i'm like i don't know i i just i, w- I would phrase it like this just because it sounds right to me and i think it's the same when it comes to like a marketing skill like writing or something like this you have to learn you know why you approach things naturally in a certain way and therefore how you can pass that kind of uh, strategy and uh, an approach onto other people so it's it's all about kind of um it's like learning in reverse basically <laughs> you have the skill straight away you have to learn like how you have that skill and, and why it's important but yeah super super interesting stuff and yeah really really great nuggets of insight for the uh for the listeners Yeah basically what you said is a shortcut and pathway to everything that you do it applies to everything reverse engineering and start from the end and visualize what needs to happen that's all yeah like as simple as possible super yeah. stuff well guys i think we can end on that note i think it's a wrap nemanja thank you many many thanks for for being with us today guys we had nemanja jivkovic from uh, funky marketing a really trending trending company in terms of the marketing and out there in the B2B sphere. Don't forget to subscribe to Twip, your favorite podcast in terms of B2B marketing and business and life. Uh you can find us on most of the podcast carriers on YouTube obviously. Take care and see you next time. Ciao ciao. Cheers guys, bye bye. Nice. That was that was a nice conversation.